This morning we're going to ponder Christ's most frequently mentioned and described emotion in the Bible, and that's compassion. And I want you to look at with me at 1 John chapter 3. And I hope that before we're done this morning, you understand the incredible tie between compassion in the heart of a believer and contentment in the heart of a believer. And basically, what I want to show you is that Christ was moved with compassion, and when we aren't moved with compassion, there's usually a a very common cause, and that's because we have so much and we're discontented and wish we had a little more, and we're not really willing to sacrifice. Uh, 1 John 3, and we're going to read all of it in a moment, but the part that got me is uh, verse 17. It says, if you have this world's goods and see your brother in need and shut your heart from him, how does the love of God abide in you? When we aren't compassionate, there's usually one cause. As the Lord said in Revelation 3, we're rich. And as he warns in our text, we'll look at later, 1 Timothy 6, we're discontented and not willing to sacrifice. Contented people are compassionate because they think that they have more than they need. You see, a contented person has a great condition. They always think they don't deserve all that they already have. And they certainly don't want more. And and that's that's the, the wonder of contentment. We realize we have more than we need, and therefore we're always willing to share. Discontent dries up the springs of our compassion. Contentment feeds the springs of our compassion. So think about it. Christ most frequently... Described emotion, 11 times specifically described in the Gospels and multitudes of other times indirectly described, is compassion. And his compassion is our model, it's our goal and our desire. And contentment in our hearts leads to a renewed vitality. As Paul says, we lay hold on eternal life. Contentment means we're alive and thinking and motivated by the fact that we're already immortal. We are thinking eternally. We start seeing what our moments look like as they're observed from God's throne. And all of a sudden, we see our lifespan. And all the resources we have during that lifespan were given to us by another. And he wants a return on that investment that he gave to us. With Christ's call to compassion and contentment on my mind this week, I went to that amazing United Nations population clock. Now, if you've never done this, it's the most awesome thing to sit there and watch their clock. Now, what they do is it's a, of course, it's very politicized, but it is true how many people there are. And the clock basically is this gigantic clock. You can see it online, and it's showing the world population at this second, and every second, it's just clicking off every second, the number on the end goes up by five, down by two, for a net gain of three immortal souls per second are born. Five actually are born on the planet, but two people die every second, and so we have a net gain of three. And so just sitting there, it's a very moving sight to watch that world population clock. As each second is noted, and as the numbers are flipping and changing before you, and then at the bottom, the math of this UN site is quite simple. It says, the number goes up by five births, down by two deaths for net gain of three. And I wish that they'd program onto their site instead of just saying three uh, more mouths to feed, which is what they're harping on there, uh, and three more consumers, I wish they'd write three more immortal souls on planet Earth every second. Well, all around the site are listed the details, which helps us feel the immensity of our world. If you watch that clock for a while and see those three surviving souls every second, You think about that going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it basically runs about 70-some million people a year, more. That means the U.S. is reproduced. All of our country is reproduced somewhere else every four years. There's another country the size of America. We're the third largest country in the world right now. It's hard to believe how many people there are on this planet. Well, as we sit in relatively well-fed and uncrowded Tulsa, and relatively prosperous in the American heartland, we need to look again at our world. And I want to describe to you, before we read uh, 1 John chapter 3, and especially 16 and 17 and 18, I want to describe to you the people on our planet. Just a broad brushstroke, okay? There are, last night at 11 o'clock, okay, I didn't have time to look it up this morning, there were 6 billion... 
273,632,243 living souls on our planet. If you just take the 6 billion off, the other 273 million are us, Americans, okay? So there's us, Americans, 273 million, blah, 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 and 6 billion of them. That's how many are on the planet. But if we were to reduce that unimaginable number of a six with nine zeros after it to fit in this room, now think, put the whole world in here representatively. And if we said that the whole world had 100 people in it, okay, so we're going we're gonna to reduce down 6.273 billion to one, it's kind of like Congress, okay, a House of Representatives. There's one person represented in this room for every uh, six, 62 million people, okay? So that's just to give you. But we'd put 100 in this room, okay? If our world was shrunk down to a community of 100 persons, here's what the room would look like. 13 people would live in the balcony. That's, that's us, by the way, America, Western Europe, and the new industrialized economies. That's how the UN calls uh, Japan, um, Taiwan, Korea, and Hong Kong. They call them the NIE. They're fabulously wealthy like we are in Europe. So we would all be up in the balcony, us, one-seventh of the world population, 13 of us. The developed world, we'd be up there. But the rest of the world, 87 people, would be down here in, in, with no chairs down here in the bottom. Those in the balcony are the world's richest. We have the houses. We have the stuff. In fact, most people in the industrialized world, that's America, have an average of two rooms per person. If you took all the houses in America and divided the number of rooms in them by our population, there are more than two rooms for every body in the United States. Two rooms. That's how we live in the balcony, the industrialized world. The rest of the world puts five bodies in each room. You understand, we get two rooms for one body. That means you can't be in both rooms at once. You can never be alone in the rest of the world. You have five bodies in every room. If you took all the homes of all the people that live outside of Western Europe, the United States, and the new industrialized economies, their total number of rooms in their houses make five bodies have to fit in each one. It's just staggering to think how they live. The rest of the world, the... Others, other than the industrialized world, which has 800 million people, which is code for wealthy, live on much less than we do. One billion people today will live on less than a dollar. Less than a dollar. Now, now I've been in almost every corner of the world, even less than a dollar. I mean, you might say, well, it costs less over there. Not that much less. That means that they just barely get enough to eat. That's what a billion people have. Now, three billion people get $2 a day. They're quite well off. They get twice as much, which means they aren't in complete poverty but near it. But what's amazing is of the undeveloped world, that's 87% of the population of the world, three-quarters of them will never celebrate their 50th birthday. Do you understand that? I mean, Americans, I mean, if you don't live to be 50, there's something wrong with you. You know what I mean? We're healthy. We're prosperous. We eat right. We exercise. We, we take vitamins, and we, we heat our homes, and we filter our water and our air. These people won't even make it to 50 because they don't filter their air. They don't filter their water. In fact, 2.5 billion people in the world have no electricity, period. They could never have electricity. There's no electricity near them to filter their water and filter their air and cook their whatever and light their houses. They just don't have it. Well, we, the fortunate 13 in the balcony, hold 80% of the wealth of the world. Now think about that. We have 80% of all the wealth, the 13% of the world in the industrialized nations. The other 87% obviously don't have it. Uh, in our balcony, we have half the homes, we have 85% uh, of the automobiles, 80% of the TV sets, give those away, 93% of the telephones, they're catching up fast, by the way, cell phones are going to change that. We have an average income, listen to this, us in America, Europe, and the Far East, 27000 per person. Now that's average, but that's a lot, and it's true, 27000 per year per person in our part of the world, they live on less than $700 a year. 
Do you know the difference between $27,000 and $700? That's a staggering difference in their annual incomes. Well, how do the fortunate hill dwellers use our incredible wealth? Well, I don't know how the Europeans, uh, although it was interesting reading this UN site, it's just gross to read. It tells everything. It tells how much everybody spends on perfume and ice cream. And, but I just studied America, and this is interesting. Most Americans, I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about the demographics of our country. Of our dollar, we earn. 20% we give back to tax. You know, a lot of you give more, uh, some give less, but its average is 20% on taxes. This is interesting. Americans spend 26% of every dollar they make on their homes. They're important. 18% goes to food, 17% for our health and beauty and all that. 12% on our cars and transportation, 8% on recreation. I thought that was interesting. And amusement, the government said. 7% on clothes. Now listen to this. This is America. 2%. Actually, it was less, but I rounded it up. 2% on charitable. Now, I'm not talking about Christians. Although George Barna said Christians give 2.5%. So that is very, very monumental. That Christians give a half percent more than pagans. But it doesn't matter. 2% of American income is given for religious and charitable uses, and a fraction of that ever leaves the country. So we're talking about the wealthiest nation on earth. By the way, we control a third of all the wealth in the world, America. The whole global economy is $32 trillion, and we have 12 of them right here with 4% of the people. Do you realize how wealthy we are? You don't think you're wealthy because you're looking at Bill Gates or or build a fortune, or, or whoever's rich, you know, the uh, Kaiser of Bank of Oklahoma. You are rich if you look at one person outside this country that doesn't live in Western Europe or in the new uh, industrial economies. Well, veteran missionary to India, noted author Paul Brandt, once asked this question. I ask it to myself often. I wonder how the people down here, the 87 crowded down here on the floor, most of whom, a third at least, are malnourished. Look on us who live up in the balcony. As we have two rooms for everybody, as we have 80% of all the vehicles, and you know what I mean, all that stuff? We've got, we've got 87% of, of the wealth, and they've got 13, and yet they have 87% of the people, and we are only 13. And if you look at that inequity, I wonder what they think of us up there. Because they're down there, and they have nothing. Of course, what we say is they don't work hard and they don't deserve it, right? Isn't that the American work ethic? We earned it and they didn't. And there is something to that. Well, let's think about that, listening to what Christ said. Because the problem I have starting in 1 John 3.16 is that the vast majority of Christians in the world are in that poor part of the world. Do you understand that? The vast majority of Christians do not live in the industrialized world. Why? Because the poor people hear him gladly. The rich people don't need him. And so don't worry about the animists, the Buddhists, the Islamists. Think about the Christians that live in abject poverty while we spend more money than they have to live on just on dog food and perfume, et cetera, et cetera. First John chapter 3, and I'm going to start in verse 16. And listen to Christ as he talks about this, especially when it comes to our compassion and our contentment. By this, verse 16 of 1 John 3, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And so we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. For other believers. Verse 17. Whoever has this world's goods. That's a very interesting statement. Has goods. Remember, there are two kinds of people in Christ's day. Those that live from day to day. They had nothing. They just ate for the day. They worked. They bought food. They ate for that day. They had nothing. The next morning, they worked and bought food and ate for that day. And that was, that was the poor. And people that didn't have to do that, that had something laid up that lasted more than a day, were wealthy. So it, the Lord makes it very simple. We would all qualify as having this world's goods. Verse 17 continues, whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need. 
becomes aware that there are other brothers and sisters that don't have this world's good and shuts his heart from him. Now, we don't intentionally do this. We don't go, eh, starve. What we say is, I'll give as soon as I have enough. But see, what we do is we don't lessen what we need. We increase it every year, so we never quite have enough to, to really express compassion because discontent makes us not think we have enough and shuts his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? How is the love of God the controlling influence in, in that life? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, just sing in the songs, or in tongue, saying we, we, we love it, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we're of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the technology of our day that we can watch a clock and see three souls a second added to planet Earth, three immortal souls. And I pray that every one of us, young and old, and especially in the context of this series we're in, for us parents, that we would pray that we would be able to communicate to our families what it means to lay hold on eternal life and what it means to lay hold on eternal life by having contentment. And when we're contented, we have the resources to be compassionate in every direction. And our lives become filled with compassion flowing out from us to the world. And we see beyond ourselves and our little tiny world and our little tiny needs and we see a far greater world that moved you with compassion and that drew you to go everywhere you could in your earthly ministry to tell more of the people of the salvation you offered them i pray that you touch our hearts with the need to be contented this morning in the name of jesus we pray amen we're going to turn back to uh first timothy chapter six and that's where we're uh going to spend a long time this morning. First Timothy chapter 6, uh, but before you get there, contentment, as we're going to study this morning, leads us to a renewed vitality in our lives. And we have to pray for that and we have to seek that. The New Testament basically talks about contentment five times. In fact, there are five passages that, that deal. In, in, in fact, let me show them to you. You probably never marked them. Uh, if you have, maybe you forgot. Let, look back at Luke. We'll get to 1 Timothy, but let me show you all five before I park. Luke chapter 3. Contentment's only mentioned five times in the New Testament. Here's the first one, Luke three fourteen, And the soldiers demanded of him, that's John the Baptist, said, What shall we do? And he said, Do violence to no one, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Luke three fourteen. Well, that's a great one to mark. Content with your wages. Now, I know I've preached on this before because I grew up in a United Auto Workers General Motors home. My dad who was a godly believer and was part of the United Auto Workers. And they were supposed to, every three years, get very upset and storm around with signs and stomp and, you know, blockade the gates and demand more money. And it always bothered my daddy. He worked for 46 years for General Motors. He immensely disliked that. And so what he did is he found that he could do something else and didn't have to stomp at the strike with the sign in front of the gate, blocking it and... And in chorus, shouting at the management that they wanted more money. By the way, the average auto worker in Michigan earns 110000 a year. But they'll strike again because discontent means it's not enough. See, what it says in Luke 3.14, be content with your wages. Now, this is five times contentment's mentioned, but two different Greek words. Here's the first word, which means satisfied. Be satisfied. Say, that's enough for me. Instead of wanting more, I'll decrease my wants. I'll decrease my, my desires to match my, my wages, which is the, I call it the Wesley principle. 
Uh, John Wesley, prolific servant of the Lord, wrote 8,000. John and Charles Wesley, between them, 8,000 hymns. But when Wesley started in ministry, he earned 10 pounds, lived on seven, gave away three. At the end of his ministry, he earned 1,000 pounds, lived on seven, gave away 993. That's called contentment. It's hard. You have to learn it. Look at Philippians 4.11. Here's the second time in the Bible contentment's mentioned. Philippians, all the way to the other end of your New Testament, 4.11. Not that I speak, this is Paul's testimony, uh, not that I speak with respect of want, for I've learned. See, contentment is not a gift from heaven. It's not one of the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't just come down on us. It has to be practiced. It's like exercise. It's like endurance. You've got to learn contentment. It's something you work on every day. I don't respect, speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. Now, it's fascinating. Paul uses a whole different word for contentment here because there are two different words for contentment, translate content, in the New Testament. This word means independent of external circumstances. What it means is, he says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned to be independent of external. I am willing to accept where God has placed me in life. I'm willing to devote my energies to the advancement of his kingdom and not my own. See, a lot of people don't like where God put them in life, and they spend their whole energy in life to get to this level, and that energy should have been used for God, but it was used to get to this level. And great. After 40 years, they're at that level. And what did they do for God? See, that's what, what Paul's saying is, I am, I am content with where God put me in life and not want to be somewhere else. And I'm not driven by external circumstances. Now, the book of Hebrews, third, okay? Third uh, use of contentment. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, probably one of the, the most precious verses in the Bible uh, is in this context where we find out about the Lord Jesus in verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. He's with us always. And we know that verse about he'll never leave us or forsake us, but he, we skip over the first part of the verse, which says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Whatever you love, you talk about, you seek, you're drawn toward, you want more and more of if you love it. And he says, don't, don't get enraptured, ensnared, and addicted to money. And be content, be satisfied with what you have. Don't want more. It's so nice you want a little more. He says, don't do it. Cut it off. Why? What's the motivator for contentment? Because Jesus said, you got me. What else do you want? We should be free from inner turmoil. We should be satisfied with our material and financial state. We should possess a sense of peace regardless of our circumstances or feelings. Okay, now back to the most important, 1 Timothy 6. This is probably the monumental passage on Christians and their money in the whole Bible. This is the most clear, definitive, very, very methodical treatment. And the Apostle Paul, remember Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy is pastoring the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the three greatest cities of the empire, one of the most affluent, one of the most materially prosperous cities, and, and little Timothy, remember, timid, weak, sickly Timothy, who was fearful in all his other problems, he was a pastor of this mega church with these mighty, powerful movers and shakers who got saved and had all this money. And so Paul's telling him how to disciple them with their money. Kind of sounds like a letter to America. And this is what he says in verse 6. Here's the, the uh, fourth occurrence of contentment in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, but godliness... With contentment is great gain. I thought godliness was great gain. No, godliness is, is robbed of its power if there's discontent. You understand that? Godliness is sapped because we can't have the compassion of Christ. We can't have... There's so many things. Uh, in fact, our prayer life is even hindered if we're discontent and, and money takes over. This word for contentment is, again, the word satisfaction. And, and contentment lies not in what is ours, but in whose we are. See, that's where we're contented. I belong to the Lord, and, and I am his, and he is mine. Now look at verse 8 of 1 Timothy 6, and this is the last occurrence in the New Testament of contentment. Now you've done a complete. Isn't it nice to finish something? You've studied every time contentment's in the, in the New Testament. Verse 8 the fifth and final. Having food and raiment. And none of you look like you're 
anorexic or starving to death this morning and malnourished, and all of you are clothed, thankfully. So that's all of us in the room. Okay, verse 8. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith, with those two things, covering and sustenance, be content. And, and now he, he uses the other word. Remember, there are two different words. One is satisfied. The other one is this word, let us be independent of external circumstances. That's what that second word means. Let us not, because somebody else in Ephesus has more than you do, don't you get discontent. Just because somebody else in in Ephesus gets more than you do for whatever you do, don't get. Just because, see, see, you're independent of of external circumstances when you're content. It's, It's just wonderful. Not wanting to be like someone, to have what others are having or doing. Okay. Now, let's walk through this passage just before we go. And, and I ask you a question. How do you possibly teach this to children? How, how would you teach children who, I mean, they got one sucker in their mouth and their eye in a second one. You know what I mean? I mean, they got the sucker in their mouth. They want a coolie, too. You know? I mean, I have a three-year-old. I mean, she's going, can I have a coolie? I mean, she already got the, the blow pop in her mouth, you know. Can't even keep her mouth shut, and she wants a coolie, too. I mean, she is the most discontented child I've ever seen, three-year-old. Uh, but, but how do we learn and teach contentment to our families? Well, the best way to start is to do a little study of First Timothy 6. And, and if you've never marked these in your Bible, what a blessing. In fact, this week we were eating lunch, and, and um, we had some friends in our house. In fact, we've had friends in our house for three weeks. I don't think they're leaving. They just they keep coming. And they always come at mealtime. And so we just do it normal. We read our Bible. And it was so sweet. I, we were reading along, and I said, okay, did, it, did Paul ever visit Colossae? And one of my children, wasn't one of the older ones, said, well, in my Bible, you said to Mark, he never did. And I said, you mean you hear me? They said, every time you do that, we write it in our Bible. And I said, oh, I didn't know anybody was listening. So... If, if you mark in your Bible, look at 1 Timothy 6, 7, and I want to show you the seven keys to promote and protect contentment. And this is what you should teach to your family and live. Number one, 1 Timothy 6, 7. Look what it says. It says, for we brought nothing into this world. By the way, I visit the hospitals all the time. Uh, I love, in fact, I will stop at the Baby floor. You know how there's that floor where you get out and there's the big glass window with all the reinforcements in it, so I guess no one can break through it, and, and all the nurses and all those bassinets, and there's all those babies in there just lined up, and they, they have them all so you can look at them, and people are always crowding at the window and looking and picking out theirs. Did you know all those babies came into the world with nothing? And I've been at the other end, too. I've been in the funeral homes, and you know what? They leave with nothing. What a true verse. Look at verse 7. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. Truth number one, always remember things are only temporary. Everything you see, everything, everything, every house, every possession, every collection, every um, whatever thing there is in this world, every one of them are temporary. When I was little, my parents used to do a weekly discipleship lesson. They took me to the dump. Do you know what? You ever heard down in the dumps? Well, I know what down in the dumps means because we had, I guess they call them sanitary landfills now or a transfer station. That's a really neutral a transfer station. Transferred from my trunk to yours, you know. But, but, but a dump, I love the dump. You drive in with your trailer and all your trash on it and you'd crickle along because you're driving over broken glass and you'd wind around between these mounds of flies and smoke. I mean, it was like Gehenna. And we'd, we'd find a place where it either wasn't burning or stinky, and we'd shovel our stuff out and drive as quick as we could away. But while they were doing that, us kids would look through everybody's junk and find some and put it in the trailer and take it home with us. Because some people's junk wasn't as junky as our junk, and so we thought it was a treasure. But you know what? You'd look there and you'd see that beautiful bike that the kids wanted for so long that's now all twisted and dented and rusted and flat-tired and... 
and would be on a pile of junk. And you'd see that lampshade that that mother used to scream and yell, don't touch it and don't ruin it and don't poke it. And, and now it's all tattered and frazzled and, you know, that silk lampshade. They don't make them that way anymore, but in the dump we used to see them. And then you'd see that old TV set that someone had to smash out with a sledgehammer, you know, and it was in that beautiful, and don't touch it, and they polished it, but now it's junk. Things, all things, are only temporary. Remember that. Remember that. Look at verse 8. This is what he says in verse 8. Having food and clothing, these, with these we shall be content. Point number two. If point number one is always remember things are only temporary, point number two is only seek necessities and wait for the rest. Wait for the rest. You know, I, I am from the old generation. Bonnie and I never bought anything when we got married until we could pay for it completely. You know how long it took for newlyweds to afford the first couch? I mean, we... We had get, we lived, I was, at, I was in Los Angeles, and we would have people come to our house, and they couldn't sit on a, a couch. They had to sit on a wooden chair that we bought at a rummage sale for $5 because we were still saving to buy our first couch because we couldn't buy it on credit. We were, remember the old-fashioned world where you only bought what you could afford? It's really liberating because then it's paid for right then and not for five years, you know, or three years or 72 months or whatever. And, and I remember the, the thrill we had when we bought our first couch after we were married for uh, three months. And it was a used couch. They call them sanitized. You buy them from the Goodwill, and they sanitize them. I don't know what that means. I hope it meant they killed the germs in it or whatever. But it was a sanitized couch, and it had a tag on it, and it was used. But that was a major purchase for us. You know what? We have to realize we should seek necessities and wait for the rest. Something's happened in America. Nobody waits for anything. They don't wait for marriage. They don't wait for, they don't wait for anything. They want it now. He says you should only seek necessities, wait for the rest, and be content. Third point, look at verse 9. This is a great Bible study uh, to go over it with your children until they understand what you mean. You put in your own stories. I'll leave mine out. I could put in a story for every one of these, but... Verse 9, uh, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, don't they? I mean, look at, the, look at what's going on with all these people being imprisoned. Have you watched them? You know, the, uh, the WorldCom people, and I forget who, uh, the, the Adelphia Company people, you know, all these multimillionaires. They already had so much. When I was in college, I used to, uh, in the summers, work on a, a high-end pool company. I, my part was I ran a jackhammer. <laughs> Boy, that was fun. But we would go to these people in Princeton, New Jersey. That's where the big money is, you know, out of Philadelphia and New York City. They run the trains up to the city. We would do pools. I mean, pools that are as big as this whole half the auditorium. We would do pools for dog houses. I mean, dog ho- air-conditioned dog houses. Dog houses that are bigger than most people's garages, and it was just for their dogs. It wasn't for their kids, it was for their dogs. And their dogs had pools with steps. I mean, this is, I mean, that's how those people live. And now they're getting handcuffed because they wanted just a little more. Right? What does the Bible say? Avoid the consuming desire for prosperity. Because if you desire to be rich, Paul said in verse 9, you'll fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and harmful lusts, which will drown you in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You start being willing to lie and to cheat and to steal and to deceive and to, to give up what is eternal for what's temporal. He says, don't get near that, from which some have strayed from the faith. In fact, we were reading the Bible yesterday, I think, at lunch. And in fact, one of the friends that's always in our house was actually reading it for us. I mean, they've moved right in. They were reading the Bible. And it was talking about Demas. And I said, isn't it sad that Demas, at the end of Colossi, or Colossians, was still in the faith, and by the time we get to 2 Timothy, he's departed because he loved the world. Why? Avoid the consuming desire for prosperity is the third point. Number four, look at verse 11. The point for verse 11 is flee materialism. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee what things? Verses 9 and 10. The, the desire to be rich, the lust and temptation and snare for money. Flee it. Flee materialism. And while you're fleeing it, run toward, verse 11 says, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Number five. 
Cling to eternal life. We saw this last week. Look at verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Cling to it. Hold as tight as you can. You have to be like the kids at the nursery. Walk over there sometime and watch the parents trying to put them in. And those kids are attached to their leg and they're like that. You hold on to eternal life like those kids do when they don't want to go in the nursery. Okay, cling to eternal life. Look at verse 19. It says the, the same thing. Store up for yourselves a good foundation to lay hold on eternal life. Cling to eternal life. Number six, 1 Timothy 6.17 has the sixth truth. Pin your hopes on God. Command those who are rich in this world not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Pin your hopes on God. I hear people all the time. They say, well, I hope we have enough to... I, I hope this investment will, I hope this job will last. What are they pinning their hopes on? I hope we have enough money to make it to the end. I hope we have enough money to pay for our nursing home bills. I hope we have enough money to get the kids through. I, I hope this job will last long enough to, do you know, step back and think about what you're saying. You're pinning your hopes on the investment, the money, the job, right? You're hoping that will get you through. You know what it says here? Verse 17, command those who are rich in this world not to be haughty or to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Pin your hopes on God. Say, by God's grace, we'll do that. And I, I am trusting the Lord that whatever he wants me to do, he which began it will finish it. And, and finally, verse 18, here's the last truth. Number seven, let them do good, be rich in doing good works, ready to give, willing to share. That's very interesting. There's four different ways of giving, and, and I don't have time to, to enlarge on them. We will in the future. But I, I s- summed up the 17th verse, or the 18th verse, under one heading. I love it. Give until it hurts. How do you like that? Give until it hurts. If, if you can give, and it, and it just went by, and you went, wow, yeah, that was, that was nice to give to And then you give again, you don't even think twice about it. But when you give and you lose something, or you have to give something up, or or it's not going to be so sure you can do something in the future, that's what he's talking about, giving till it hurts. So what are these seven things we should teach our children? Number one, verse seven, always remember things are only temporary. Always remember that. Take them to the dump and show them that. Number two, only seek necessities. Wait for the rest, and that will transform marriages and, and homes. Number three, avoid a consuming desire for prosperity. What is prosperity? It's comfort and security. A prosperous person is comfortable and secure. Do you know what the curse of the older generation in America is? They have a lust for comfort and security. A lust for it. Our, our, our American, the people who live in the balcony, have a lust for comfort and security. It's amazing. Avoid that. Number four, flee materialism, verse 11. Number five, cling to eternal life. Cling to it. 1 Timothy 6, 12, and 19. Pin your hope on God, verse 17 says, and give until it hurts. What are the results of being content? If you're content, you can enjoy the present rather than being anxious about the future. If you're content, you can be liberated to truly enjoy the successes of others around you without envy because you don't want what they have. And finally, if you're content, you'll be able to let the Lord build a true sense of thankfulness about everything, and you will have his compassion if you're content. Because I already already have more than I need and more than I want. And so I don't mind having less, and I don't mind giving what I have to someone else as the compassion of Christ grips my heart. Amen?